Israel. Hello, Israel. Yeah, it's fine now. We can yeah, now go ahead. Now. We can go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so you can hit the ground running. We're now recording. So good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining this session. Today, we'll be doing a re recap, like a revision of what we learned as far as consolidated statement of uh, consolidated income statement is concerned. We would be solving uh, one or two questions before this session expire. But before going into the questions we will be solving, we will take a recap of what we have learned previously. So I sent uh, something like a key point to the group. For those who don't have it, you can just focus on what I'm projecting. So I would like to confirm at this point, if you can see what I'm projecting, please, if you can't, let me know if you can also let me know so can you see what i'm projecting now okay thank you someone has responded yes you can all right so like we learned earlier, a typical group accounting uh, question is like history, it's like story. And the story is broken down into what happened at acquisition. After that story ends, the next story is what happened at post, during the post acquisition period. And if the question is so complex, the next thing will be, if there is an associate or a joint venture, the next storyline would be about a second investment made by the parent. So, and at the end of the day, at the end of all everything, all said and done, the last thing we need to do is to apportion the profit or loss for the year to NCI based on NCI's percentage. So these are largely, uh, these are like an overview of the three ways you can break down any group accounting question. So for us today, we'll just first look at the recap of how each aspect will affect the preparation of consolidated statements of profit or loss and OCI. So the first set of a uh, story you would uh, play with in a group accounting question is what happened on the date of acquisition. So as far as preparing profit or loss is concerned, uh, before, before I go into that, on the date of acquisition, your goal, your ultimate goal is to use that information to calculate goodwill. That is your ultimate goal. Once you can achieve that goal, you can then move to post acquisition. And once we get to post acquisition, it's a matter of intra-group transactions. So at acquisition, like I said earlier, the goal is to calculate goodwill. And in calculating goodwill, there are three important ingredients. There is a way each of these ingredients affect the preparation of profit or loss account. And that is what I have uh, briefly uh, documented in that uh, small key point handout I sent earlier, which I'm also projecting now. So for example, the number one ingredient for calculating goodwill is consideration transferred, fair value of consideration transferred, which can come in different forms. So here on the key point, you can see how each typical form of consideration will affect your preparation of profit or loss account. For example, if it's a cash consideration, most times it has no impact on preparing your profit or loss account because uh, cash is an asset. So it will be dealt with at the point of preparing consolidated statement of financial position. It starts there and ends there. So most times it doesn't affect how, what you do in your profit or loss account. And uh, the next uh, ingredient for calculating goodwill, as you know, is the value of NCI. 
uh, once you are on that third, uh, second ingredient, your, the question you need to ask yourself is what method is NCI valued? And you can easily pick it up from the question. Is it a, it's the proportionate or partial method or the fair value or full value method? Either way, there is a way each of these methods affect the preparation of the profit or loss account. For example, under the proportionate method, the impairment loss on goodwill is not, is not apportioned to NCI. That is at the point of sharing the subsidiary's profit or loss for the year. So you don't apportion impairment loss to NCI under the proportionate method. But under the full method, of course, um, impairment loss is apportioned to NCI because in the first place, NCI also has a share in the goodwill. Uh, the third
Hello, everyone. Apologies for the break in transmission. So, so we can just go ahead. We are. We spoke earlier about um, how each of the ingredients affects the computation of goodwill. We are the third ingredient where we learned that the extra and the reduction in the position would affect the preparation of the profit or loss account. And fair value adjustment may sometimes affect profit or loss accounts if it relates to post acquisition. So if it's arising from post acquisition adjustments, then it may affect a profit or loss or OCI in line with IS 16 or IS 38. Um, if there is a gain on a bargain purchase instead of a positive uh, goodwill figure, a gain on a bargain purchase can be presented as a separate item as an income in the profit or loss account. And uh, also in payment loss, like we said earlier, in payment loss, if it's full goodwill, you have to share between parent and NCI. And if it's partial goodwill, only the parent is expected to take that lot. So aside the um, at acquisition, the next is post acquisition. So post acquisition is a majorly intra-group transactions, it relates majorly to intra-group transactions. And here on we have how each of these typical intra-group transactions would affect a profit or loss. The bottom line and the principle is that one party would have recognized the income, another party would have recognized an expense. So our duty or our responsibility is to fish out the income and fish out the expense and eliminate the both of them from the consolidated income statement at any point in time. Um, aside the post acquisition, the next thing you also pay attention to is how to calculate the associate uh, share of profit for the year. That is the parent share of profit for the year from the associate. And uh, lastly, we're also expected to apportion some of the subsidiaries profit to NCI based on NCI's uh, percentage shareholding. So once you are conversant with these four aspects, you are good to go. So before I go ahead into solving any question, I would like to ask the room, I would like to ask the class, do you have any question before we go ahead? If you are too shy to respond, you can just send a chat, no, and we are fine. So Chinwe, David, um, Wasio, Ifai, Rose, do you have any question or can we go ahead? We can go ahead, sir. Okay. So um, I also sent, I also shared a question on the group. I will project that question now. I shared the question on the group and that's the question we will solve right away. It's an ACCA past question. Now we can just play with it and move ahead. So if you're with me, I'm with you. Can you see my screen? So if, is what is projected the question or, I hope I'm not projecting the key points. Please, I would appreciate your response. So can someone just check if what is projected? Yes, we can see okay, the yeah. question. All right then, thank you. Then we move ahead with solving the question then. So I will just read the question and uh, you can just follow. So I read question one. Hostaling purchased the following equity investments. On 1st October 20X5, that's the first investment now, was acquired on 1st October 20X5. 80% of the issued share capital of Sunli was acquired on that date. The acquisition was through a share exchange of three shares in Hostalin for every five shares in Sunli. 
The market price of wholesaling shares at 1st October 20x5 was 5 Naira per share. So the next paragraph now, that's the second investment. So the first investment was 80% shares in Sunly. So the second investment now is was on 1st July 20x6, 6 million shares in Amber, paying 3 Naira per share in cash, and issuing to AMBA's shareholders 6% actual and effective rate loan notes on the basis of 100 Naira loan notes for every 100 shares acquired. The summarized income statement for the three companies for the year ended 30th September 20X6 are available below. So all figures are assumed correct to the additional information. Following information is relevant. The other income is a dividend received from Sunly on the 31st March 20X. Additional information two. The details of Sunly's and Amber's share capital and reserves at 1st October 20X5 were provided below and all figures are assumed correct. Equity shares retained earnings for each company. Additional information three. A fair value exercise was carried out at the date of acquisition of Sunly with the following result. Again, all figures are assumed correct. The fair values have not been reflected in Sunly's financial statement. Plant depreciation is included in cost of sales. No fair value adjustments were required on the acquisition of AMPA. Additional information. Four. In the year ended 30th September 20X, Hostaling sold goods to Sunly at a selling price of 18 million naira. Hostaling made a profit of cost plus 25% on these sales. 7.5 million at cost to Sunly of these goods were still in inventories of Sunly at 30th September 20X. Additional information five. In payment tests for both Sunly and Amber were conducted on 30th September 20X. They concluded that the goodwill of Sunly should be written down by 1.6 million Naira. And due to its losses since acquisition, the investment in Amber was worth 21.5 million. Additional information six. All trading profits and losses are deemed to accrue evenly throughout the year. Additional information seven. It is group policy to value NCI at acquisition at its proportionate share of the fair value of the subsidiary's identifiable net assets. Required. Prepare the consolidated income statement for the hosteling group for the year ended 30th September 20X6. It's a 15 mark question. So like we said earlier, the whole of this story can easily be pieced into at acquisition, post acquisition, uh, and the investment in associate bit. From the beginning of the question, this story that happened on 1st October 20X5 is simply what happened at acquisition. Um, what year, what year? Uh, let's just go with the reporting date there. I can't say the particular year. And I may not understand what you mean by what year. So additional information, one talks about a dividend received. It's more of an intra-group transaction. Additional information two, three, still tells us about what happened at acquisition. Additional information four and five are largely about things that happened post acquisition. Let's just dive right into the question. We'll be applying uh, the contents of the key point in dealing with each additional information one by one and we'll be following our typical approach of solving a consolidated income statement question. So I will just open the Excel document where I have um, the question.
So I have the question. So I have the question here. So I've picked uh, for each company the figures you are seeing in that question. In this second sheet, I will be preparing the consolidated statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income. So I'll just put it above Osterlin Group. Consolidated statement of profit or loss. and other comprehensive income for the year ended 30th September 20x6. So since it's the consolidated results, these will not be needed again. So what we will just need are just just one line will be fine. So first things first, our working one. We'll move to our workings. Working one is what we we'll use to showcase our group structure. And if you remember, the group structure is used to identify, of course, to learn about the group structure and at the same time, identify whether or not there is control. <clears throat> Sunli, so hosteling and Sunli, you can put the percentage here. And the question states it clearly. The company acquired 80%. So that means the remaining 20% is NCI. So both the 80 and the 20, they add up to 100. Immediately after doing that, it's always advisable to quickly fish out the date of acquisition because there could be what they refer to as acquisition during the year. And you fish out the reporting date, piece of cake. The reporting date can easily be um, determined from the requirement. In that question, Hostaling was acquired on 1st October 2005, 20x5. And the reporting date is 30th September 20x6. So we have it. This simply means that this was not an acquisition during the year. Instead, the acquisition took place at the beginning of the year. So we will not be too bothered about the principles that come with acquisition during the year. If it was an acquisition during the year, that means the results of Sunly will be prorated line by line. We move to the second investment. If you recall in the question, Hostalin also acquired a stake in a third, in his, uh, another company referred to as Amber. And um, according to that question, Hostalin acquired 6 million shares in Amber. And the total number of shares in Amber is 15,000. So that means we'll say 6 million divided by 15,000. 6 million divided by 15,000 gives us 40%. So since it's below 51% uh, or it's not up to 51% or it's not above 50%, there is no control. The range for control is above 50%. 
So for 40%, anything from 20% to say 49% is mostly taken as an associate. So the investment in amber is an associate and will be treated as such. Again, we take a look at the date of acquisition of amber because we have to fish it out. If we don't, we might make some errors along the line and to avoid such, to avoid stories that touch. I didn't know, I didn't see it to just fish it out. So the date of acquisition of amber is uh, first, 1st July 20X6, 1st July 20X6. The reporting date, of course, is still remains 30th September 20X6. So it appears that the acquisition of Sunli was not during the year. However, the acquisition of Amber took place during the year. So we have to take extra care when we get to Amber. Because once it relates to stuff during the year, we have to always parade as much as possible. So this will be investment two. And working one is about good structure. Okay, we have fished out what we need to fish out from additional, I mean, from the group structure. We move to working two. I remember our working two is an analysis that shows the adjusted line items. This is driven by what we meet in the additional information. So to populate working two, we'll pick each additional information one by one. To populate working tool, we'll pick each additional information one by one. We start from the acquisition of Sunly. So before I go ahead again, any question? Any question? You can just indicate in the chat section and we move on. All right. A question has popped up. How was the 40% derived? Mm -hmm. So how was the 40% derived? That's the question that popped up. Now, here is the question. On 1st July 20X6, so this is where I'm I'm reading from <clears throat> 6 million shares in amber was acquired so if 6 million was acquired what is the total number of shares in amber if we just scroll down a little we will see in working two that the total number of shares in amber is 15000 so simply 40% was derived by seeing 6000 that's the number of shares 6 million the number of shares acquired divided by the total number of shares in amber of 15 million. So if you press that on a calc, it will throw up 40%. So that was how the 40% was derived, Victor. I hope that's clear. So we can go ahead. <clears throat> so we want to treat each additional information one by one. Um, let me see what Victor is saying here. Okay, fine, okay, I think that's fine then. Remember, every group accounting question should be, can be broken down into at acquisition, post acquisition, and the stuff relating to additional information. At acquisition, the objective is to treat the items used in calculating goodwill. And what items are used in calculating goodwill? Number one is consideration transferred. So I'm looking at the question now. I'm searching for the consideration transferred. In my head, I'm at acquisition. In my head, at acquisition, the objective is to treat goodwill. So I'm looking at the question. I start with the first line used in calculating goodwill, which is consideration transferred. 
And here they said that the acquisition was through a share exchange of three shares in whole sterling for every shares, five shares in Sunly. That's clearly a share exchange. That means one of the forms of concentration transferred was a share exchange. Okay, the next question I ask myself is, how do I treat this in a consolidated income statement? When there is a share exchange, how does it affect a consolidated income statement? Well, I just refer to this my key point. If there is a share exchange, and here is it here, he says no impact. Why is there no impact on PL? Remember, it's share exchange. The impact will be on equity, share capital, and share premium, as the case may be. And we all know that equity is not an income statement item. Therefore, the consideration transferred for acquisition of Sunly would have no impact on the consolidated income statement because it's a share exchange. I read through again whether there is any other form of consideration transferred and lo and behold, it was only a share exchange. So that means the whole consideration transferred to acquire Sunly would have no impact in the preparation of our consolidated income statement. That's one. Second ingredient for calculating goodwill. The second ingredient for calculating goodwill is value of NCI. Remember we said that the value of NCI can either be proportionate or full. So let us see how the value NCI in this question. So I just came through the question again, and there I go. Additional information, seven states it that it is group policy to value NCI at acquisition at its proportionate share of the fair value of the subsidiary's identifiable net assets. It's a no brainer. The NCI in this question is measured or is valued at partial value or proportionate value. So I go to my key point again. What does it say when NCI is measured at proportionate method? So it says that, at the point of apportioning the profit for the year to NCI, impairment loss should not be used to adjust the subsidiary's profit or loss. So that's clear. So that means that information would only be used at the point of apportioning profit or loss to NCI. So we haven't gotten to that workings yet. Therefore, we still leave it pending. The third ingredient for calculating goodwill is the fair value of the net assets of the subsidiary. So we look through the question again. Where have they talked about the fair value of the net assets of the subsidiary? I check additional information one, it's not there. I check additional information two, it's not there. Okay, thank God. Additional information three, has it. The fair value exercise was carried out at the date of acquisition of Sunly with the following results. So all this information has been uh, provided. The fair value exercise was carried at the date of acquisition of Sunly with the following results. So if you recall, when you are dealing with the fair value of the subsidiaries net as the two things are involved. One, a fair value adjustment, and two, an extra depreciation or a reduction in depreciation. So in this table, you can see clearly the carrying amount and the fair value of the subsidiary's net asset. Fair value adjustment arises from the difference between these two. Now, this fair value adjustment is arising on the date of acquisition. It is not something that occurred after acquisition. So that means it will not have any impact on profit or loss account. So what will have impact on the profit or loss account is the extra or reduction in depreciation arising from the fair value adjustment. So they've already put it there for us line by line. So if you look at the table in additional information three, the first line is intellectual property. The current amount is 18,000. The fair value is 22,000. <clears> but the remaining life is still in development. 
So the difference between this 22,000 and 18,000 is 4,000. That 4,000 is a balance sheet adjustment. It doesn't affect the profit or loss account. The next one is land. Land is also an asset, except it's a liability in some places. I don't know where land can be a liability, but the land I know is an asset. Be in wise. In, in, in wise, which wise? Even, land, even in wise, land is, uh, is an asset. I don't know where you know land as a liability here too. Maybe your moneyless are still disturbing you about it. I don't know. But even if a moneyless is disturbing you, land is an asset. So the current amount is 17,000. The fair value is 20,000. Well, the popular belief is that land is not depreciated, at least for theoretical purpose, land is not depreciated. So that is why the remaining life is, you can see there in that second line, the road not applicable. So they didn't put any useful life for the land. The last line is plant. The current amount of the plant is 30,000 and the fair value is 35,000. So there is a fair value adjustment of 5,000. That 5,000 fair value adjustment is a balance sheet something. It's a balance sheet adjustment. It doesn't affect profit or loss account because the difference is arising on the date of acquisition. So it will be used in calculating goodwill. However, for plant, we have the useful life here, which is five years. Recall from our key points, let me just quickly open it. Now, once there is an extra or reduction in depreciation, that extra reduction in depreciation must be calculated. And once it is calculated, look at it here. Extra depreciation should be added to cost of sales or administrative expenses or any line item indicated in the question. So finally, our search as we just caught one fish with our search. We have been searching for items that affect profit or loss account. So we finally have one. And that is the depreciation effect of this plant, of this fair value adjustment. So I will just go to our workings. And the question already spelled it out clearly that depreciation should be taken as cost of sales. So it means that I'm going to adjust my cost of sales. So the first company I'll write down here is um, Hostaling. And the second company is Sunli. Please take note, Amber is an associate. Associates are not consolidated. The sole basis for consolidated financial statement is control. So once there is no control, you can't consolidate. So for AMBA, there was no control all through the year. So we cannot consolidate AMBA for whatever reason. You only consolidate subsidiaries. So hostaling, I will just pick hostaling's cost of sales from here. Here is hostaling's cost of sales. <clears throat> I would also pick Sunly's cost of sales from here. So now I want to adjust this cost of sales with the extra depreciation. And how are we getting the extra depreciation? Remember there was a fair value of 35,000 minus the carrying amount of 30,000 divided by the useful life, which is five years, divided by five years. Please take note of something. You don't multiply it by the number of years since acquisition. You, for profit or loss purpose, you only pick the depreciation for the year. If it was balance sheet you were preparing, you will have to calculate the depreciation since acquisition. But for profit or loss, you only calculate depreciation attributable to the year. So because we acquired the subsidiary since the beginning of the year, so it's going to be 12 over 12. So we can put that formula here, 35,000, which is the fair value, minus 30,000, which is the current amount, divided by five years, 
that's the useful life of course times 12 over 12. So our extra depreciation arising from the fair value adjustment is 1000. So as far as that additional information is concerned, it's finished. We take another step of it. So remember, we are picking each ingredient used in calculating goodwill one by one. And we are looking at how each of them will affect the profit or loss account. We have checked the consideration transferred. The consideration transferred was share exchange. It doesn't affect profit or loss. We have checked the value of NCI. We noted that the value of NCI will only affect profit or loss at the point of apportioning the profit for the year to NCI. We looked at the third ingredient. The third ingredient was fair value of net asset at acquisition. We found out that there is a fair value adjustment of 5,000, which we are expected to divide by five years, which is the useful life, to arrive at the extra depreciation. And that's exactly what we have done now. The final item. The final item is the impairment loss on the goodwill. The final item we need to consider is the impairment loss on the goodwill. So we can check the question. Was there any impairment loss as far as the question is concerned? Yes. In additional information, five. Impairment tests for both Sunli and Amber were concluded on 30 September 20X. They concluded that the goodwill of Sunli should be written down by 1.6 million. So, what does the key point say about impairment loss? How do we handle impairment loss? Simple. We are expected to add the impairment loss to administrative expenses or any line item indicated in the question. In practice, most times, impairment losses are seen as part of administrative expenses. They are usually classified as such. Well, if the question states otherwise, please don't uh, create your own question in the hall. Just obey, add it to the particular line item required by the question. And of course, some text add it to cost of sales. The most important thing, as far as I'm concerned, is that it should be added to an expense line. Although the expense line should be added to sometimes should also make sense and administrative expense would suffice. So the impairment loss of 1.6 million, I will just go and add it to the administrative expenses, jelly, without arguing with anybody. So say impairment loss on goodwill. Is that we should add that to administrative expenses? So to complete this, we can say, okay, how much administrative expense does hosteling have? So as far as the question is concerned, hosteling's administrative cost is 75. How much is Sunly's administrative cost? Sunly's administrative cost is 7,000. So here we go. We have the administrative expense. So as for calculation of goodwill, we have attended to all the ingredients used in calculating goodwill. I would take you back to our small key points. Take a look at the key points. When calculating goodwill, first ingredient, consideration transferred, we have checked it in the question. It is share exchange. So because it's share exchange, no impact. The next ingredient is value of NCI. This comes in 
only at the point of apportioning profit or loss to NCI. So at this point, it is not yet useful. The last ingredient is fair value of net assets of the subsidiary at acquisition. We have looked at the fair value adjustment and we have seen that none of the fair value adjustments affect the profit or loss account because each of those adjustments are balance sheet adjustments. We have also looked at the extra depreciation. <clears throat> we noted an extra depreciation of 1,000 as a result of adjusting the plant. We have checked number four, of course, there was no gain on the bargain purchase. And lastly, we have identified the impairment loss on the goodwill. The impairment loss on the goodwill was 1.6 million and we have added it to administrative expenses. So if I take you back to that question, additional information three is down. We have used it. Additional information <clears throat> two has also been used. Remember what we said, that once you are done with dealing with the items relating to goodwill, <clears throat> you are done with at acquisition. That will now take you to post acquisition. Post acquisition. And post acquisition are majorly intra group transactions. There are certain or there are typical intra group transactions you will see in all these questions. Number one is sale of inventory. Number two is sale of PPE. We have intra-group current account balance. We have intra-group interest, intra-group dividend, and the likes. But the principle is that any income, any expense, any profit earned within the group must be completely eliminated. That is the principle. So we then move into the question, having this at the back of our mind as regards post-acquisition transactions. We have the typical examples here. We look at the question to see if we can find any of these examples in the question. So I skimmed through and I haven't even gone far. Additional information one, the other income is a dividend received from Sunly on 31 March 20X6. Intra-group dividend is a post acquisition transaction. An intra-group dividend means that one person has paid dividend or has declared dividend and another person has received the dividend. Remember the principle, any income, any expense, any profit within the group must be completely eliminated. So for an intra-group dividend, the parents would have collected dividend from the subsidiary. And once that parent has earned that dividend from the subsidiary, the parents would have added it as part of their own other income, as the case is in this question. So simple thing for us to do is to completely eliminate that intra-group dividend. So we we'll go to our workings. That means other income is the corporate here. We must eliminate that intra-group dividend. So I just put a line here, I call it intra-group dividend, which must be eliminated. So the hostelings and uh, other income is 400. Sunly's other income is nil. So I'm required to eliminate that intra-group dividend because intra-group the income and expenses should not exist in the consolidated income statement. So they have explained to us that that 400 you can see up there should be removed. So that's exactly what I've done here by removing it. So aside intra-group dividend, there are still other forms of intra-group transaction. There are other forms. We have to go into the question to fish them out. Intra-group dividend is just one type of intra-group transaction. 
one popular type is sale of inventory in short. There is hardly a question you won't see that in Trancoop transaction. Let's see if this question has tested it. Yes, the question has tested it in additional information four. I read the additional information four. In the year ended 30th September 20X, Coastalin sold goods to Sunli at a selling price of 18 million. Coastalin made a profit of cost plus 25% on these sales. 7.5 million at cost to Sunli of these goods were still in the inventories of Sunli at 30th September 20X6. This is sale of inventory. I'll check out my key points. What does my key point say I should do as far as sale of inventory is concerned? One, I need to identify the total sales value of the, of the inventory. Two, I need to deduct the sales value from consolidated revenue and consolidated cost of sales. Three, I need to calculate unrealized profit on the unsold inventory. And lastly, the unrealized profit, I need to add it to cost of sales. So I'll pick these things one by one. So the first thing I need to do is to identify the sales value. In this question, the sales value is 18 million Naira. So what am I to do with this 18 million Naira? Simple, deduct it from revenue, deduct it from cost of sales. That is the first thing I need to do. So that will return back to the workings again. This time, revenue would be affected. What is how? Okay, before then, so I create another line. I call it intra-group sales. The intra-group sales is 18,000, so I must back it out. I must do the same again with revenue because income and expenses with earned or incurred within the group must not be carried into the consolidated income statement. So I've done the first thing. I've knocked it out from cost of sales and I've knocked it out from revenue. The next thing I'm expected to do is to calculate my own realized profit. That will take me to work in three. Unrealized profit. The starting point is to ask how much is the unsold inventory? By unsold inventory, how much of the inventory is unsold to third party? If you take us back to that question in additional information four, the unsold inventory is 7.5 million. Look at it. They said 7.5 million of these goods were still in the inventories of Sunly. So the starting point is from that 7.5 million. So I register it. 7.5 million. The next thing is to determine the margin. Imagine how much profit margin is on this 7.5 million. I, and to get that, I can only use the margin. But when I go to the question, what was provided cost plus, this 25% is markup. So I have to mark it up to margin. And that will be 25% divided by 100 plus 25. That's 25 rather divided by 100 plus 25. Simple arithmetic. So that means the margin will be 25 divided by 100 plus 25. As simple as that. So I'll say 25 divided by 100 plus 25. So from here, I can now get my unrealized profit. Unrealized profit is simply this 75 times the 20%, and that brings us to 
0.15. So I'll call this A. I'll call this B. And I'll call this C. C is equal to A times B. And that's how I derived the unrealized profit. In our key point, it's already spelled out that an unrealized profit should be added to cost of sales. So I would add that to cost of sales. The reason is that any profits earned within the group must also be eliminated. So to eliminate it, we have to add it to a cost. In this case, cost of sales. The reason is that the unrealized profit, if you see that calculation, it's emanating from inventory, closing inventory. And closing inventory is one of the ingredients used in calculating cost of sales. So that is why the unrealized profit is added to cost of sales. So by adding it to cost of sales, profits will reduce by that amount. And by so doing, you have eliminated the unrealized profit and within the group. So as far as sale of inventory is concerned, these are the two things expected of you. Knockout intra-group sales, one. Two, calculate unrealized profit and add it to cost of sales. Once you have done those two things, you are home and dry. So you would have seen that the two intra-group transactions were fished out so far was intra-group dividend and the sale of inventory. Let's go into the question again to fish out any intra-group transaction before um, you guys start telling me if you have any questions. So I will transit back to the question again. And there we go. There is no other intra-group transaction. So the only two intra-group transactions are the intra-group dividend and secondly, the sale of inventory. So before I go ahead, my people, question. If there's any no question, please indicate. So we'll go ahead and see how we can conclude this question. So Agada, David, iPhone, um, Miriam, Ifani, Rose, Sahid, Sheyi, Victor, Kamaldin. Do we have any question? If there is no question, please indicate so I can go ahead. Someone has dropped the chat. No question from me, fine. So uh, no question from Miriam. All right, so we can go ahead. If you have any question as we move ahead, you can just send it through chat. All right, thank you, Shay. no question. Non-Victor, thank you. Thank you, YMC, no question. All right, thanks. So we'll go ahead. Look at the journey so far. Remember how we started? Every group accounting story starts from at acquisition. Then at acquisition, it goes to post acquisition. Then from post acquisition, they could not have investment in associates or joint venture. That's how the story flows, no matter how they scatter it. Recall, that at acquisition, your goal is to treat goodwill. And in treating goodwill, each item used in calculating goodwill would have one or more effects on profit or loss accounts. You are expected to have mastered how each item used in calculating goodwill affects the profit or loss account so that when you stumble on that item, you know what to do. That's the essence of sending that key point. Once you are done with treating goodwill at acquisition, the next thing is post acquisition. Recall, for post acquisition, your focus is on intra group transactions largely. And intra group transactions can come in different forms. In this question, we have seen that there were two intra group transactions one, the intra group dividend, and two, the sale of inventory. So we have dealt with treating goodwill at acquisition, as well as the impairment loss thereof. 
we have dealt with all the post acquisition issues. What that means is that we have to move to the last thing, or let me call it the third thing. That's the way the key point is also structured. The third aspect is to calculate an income or loss from the associate. That's the last thing we now need to do. We need to calculate an income or loss from the associate. You need not crack your brain too much. Here is how to calculate it. It has already been provided here. First line, uh, parent share of uh, profit or loss for the year, impairment loss, unrealized profits. So this is more of um, the three things you would typically see in calculating the income or loss from the associate or joint venture. So let's not waste time again. Let's go and fish out these three things from the question. Come with me. Let's go. So we want to calculate our income. I will just go back to our Excel document. So our Excel document will now be at working four. Income or loss from Amber. Remember Amber is our associate. The starting point is to say, okay, Stalin's share of loss for the year. Now, why did I say loss? If I take you back to the question, Amber, whom is the associate, incurred the loss of 20,000. So it's what the Amber, the Amber made. That's what you can take from. So since Amber incurred the loss, it's going to be a share of loss for the group or for the parent. So hosteling share of loss for the year will be calculated like this. Firstly, that loss of 20,000, we write it down. Times, so you don't forget, if we go back up, you will see that Amber was acquired during the year. So we cannot lay claims to 12 over 12 of that profit. We cannot lay claims to July, August, September. So that's three months. So the Amber, whatever his name is, was our associate for three months. So we can only take loss of three months from that. So we say three divided by 12. Again, we don't own 100% of um, Amber. We only own 40%. So we take only 40%. We have significant influence. So here we go. We'll say the 20,000 times 3 over 12 times 40%. So our loss, which we are taking from the associate, is 2,000. That is one aspect of the loss. Remember, there are three. So in the key points, the second one is impairment loss in the current year on investment in associates. So I go into the question to search for impairment loss. And it's there in, it's not in working four, it's in working five. I read working five. I mean, I mean, uh, addition information five rather. Impairment tests for Sony and Amber were conducted on 30 September 20X6. They concluded that the goodwill of Sony should be written down by 1.6 million. We have already treated that. And due to its losses since acquisition, the investment in Amber was worth 21.5 million. So they are giving us the closing balance of the investment in Amber, but they are giving us a clue that there is an impairment. So this 21.5 million is not the impairment. Instead, it is the closing balance. That means we have to calculate the carrying amount and compare it with this closing balance to see whether there is an impairment. So I return to our workings again. So I will create a working five now. The working five, I will call it investment in associates in amber 
the associates. Associates are accounted for using what they refer to as the equity method. And the equity method starts from consideration transferred or the cost of the investment. So how was Amber acquired? That will lead us again to the question. We have to check the question again to see the value of the consideration transferred to acquire Amber. So again, go to the question. And just uh, in the third paragraph, it's there, they said it. That on 1st July 20x6, 6 million shares in Amber paying 3 naira per share in cash. So, one, they use cash to acquire Amber. If we read further, you'll see, and issuing Amber shareholders loan notes on the basis of 100 loan notes for every 100 shares acquired. So, the acquisition of Amber was uh, a combination of cash and share and a loan note rather. So we have to calculate these two concentration and add them together to get the total concentration transferred. So we turn to our workings again. So we have the cash. The cash they said is three Naira for each six million shares that was acquired. So that is three times six million, that is 18,000. The next one is the loan note. They said that for each share, for each 100 shares acquired, they give out an, an 100 Naira loan note. So how, many, how much shares was acquired? Six million shares was acquired. So for every 100 shares, I will have to divide this six million divided by 100. So for every 100 shares, I, the parents, am to pay a 100 Naira loan note. And here we go. So we say 6,000 divided by 100 to get 100 in how many places in a, a number of places, then multiplied by 100. Of course, it's 6,000. 6,000. So the consideration transferred came in two forms, cash, which we have calculated, and the loan note, which we have also calculated. To uphold equity accounting in deriving investment in associate value or balance, we then have to adjust this for share of post acquisition reserves, profit or loss. I will also have to adjust for share of uh, post auction for OCI, but the one that concerns us is for profit or loss right now. So again, how much profit or loss have we earned from this investment after its acquisition? Look at it up here, we have calculated it before. It's 2000, so I will just, I think I will just restrict it to say loss and I pick my figure from up here, 2000, Stephanie, as simple as that. Format that figure to have um, brackets, fine. So this is the balance before in payment. So I just add this up, and the balance is supposed to be 22,000. The balance is supposed to be 22,000, based on our calculation, but Let's check out the question and see what the question is saying about the balance. Additional information five states that the investment in Amber was worth 21.5 million. 21.5 million. Okay. If you look at what we calculated here, our calculation shows 22 million, but the question is now in that the new value is 21.5 million. Ladies and gentlemen, what that means is that the investment has been impaired by 500,000. So that is the impairment loss. 
balancing figure. They didn't give us, we had to calculate it by ourselves. So again, I will just format that too. So the, it, the reason for doing all of this was so that we can just have a line item here under working for, which we refer to as impairment loss. We got it from working five. We pick our something, we drop it there again. The last item based on uh, our key point is the unrealized profit. If our associate is the seller, where associate is the seller? Well, there was no transaction between the parent and the associate during the year. So that marks the end of calculating that aspect. So the final figure for income or loss from associate is 2,500. Ladies and gentlemen, as far as the associate is concerned, the associate is down. London, London, London has fallen, I doubt the Olympus has fallen. The associate has fallen, it's down. We have handled that. So don't forget our journey. We started from our acquisition. We said that our goal at acquisition is to treat goodwill. For every item involved in goodwill, we are supposed to identify how it impacts profit or loss and treat it properly, including the impairment loss. We moved to post acquisition. We said that post acquisition are majorly intra group transactions. And we found out that the intra group transactions were the intra-group dividend of 400,000 and the um, sale of inventory, which we have also handled. From there, we moved to the investment in associates. We said that as far as PL is concerned, we are required to calculate an income or loss from the associates. We have a format already. We are expected to fish out these three things. Once we get these three things, we jam them together and we get a figure referred to as income or loss from associates. If we go by that, the way the key point is structured, the last thing is to now give NCI his share, whether he's a man, his share of profit for the year. Again, we have the ingredients, we have the recipe to cook that soup, it's here. So I will just go again to the Excel document. And we're almost there. We are closing out very soon. We're almost there. We're almost there. That's working six. Apportionment, or let's just say NCI share of profit. NCI's share of profit for the year. Of course. First line is to say, okay, what was the subsidiary's profit? That's the first line. What was the subsidiary's profit for the year? According to the question, the subsidiary, that's uh, Sunli, his profit for the year is 13,000. So again, we'll say, 13,000 times 12 over 12. Remember, we control that subsidiary for the whole 12 months. If it was an acquisition during the year, we would have said 6 over 12, 7 over 12, or 9 over 12. But there was no acquisition during the year for the subsidiary. The acquisition during the year only relates to the associate. So I would just say 13,000 times 12 over 12. That's the subsidiaries. We have to adjust this figure for certain items. 
Now, the principle behind this adjustment is to say one, what items did we treat that ought to be shared between parent and NCI? Or what item did we treat that arise only from the subsidiary? But most times, these three will usually fall under the adjustment. Number one is if there is an extra, if there was extra depreciation. Number two is impairment loss on full goodwill. Number three is unrealized profits where the sub is the seller. By sub, I mean the subsidiary. I don't mean MTN subscription. And the last adjustment is now driven by understanding whether there are any other, uh, any other item that has to be shared between the parent and the NCI. So the question is, all these three things, where can we get them from? You need not think too much. That is the essence of that working tool. Working tool is the brain box of majority of what you have been doing as far as the subsidiary is concerned. That working tool is the brain box. So the extra depreciation, I will just go and pick it from working tool. I've already done that calculation in working tool. Look at it here. So I have to deduct it. Was there any impairment loss on full goodwill? No. If you recall, the impairment loss was on a partial goodwill. Remember that the goodwill is on partial value. The next thing, the unrealized profit. Yes, there was unrealized profit. But if you look through the question, the parent was the seller. So this will automatically be nil. So that can now take us to the adjusted figure, the adjusted profits of the subsidiary, and that's a, it's 12. So if the adjusted figure is 12, we can calculate NCI's share at 20%. So that's this times 20%. There we go, that's NCI share. So ladies and gentlemen, once we have done that last thing, that is the end of the question. We can now close out on all other workings. For example, we haven't gotten the total cost of sales. So we have to derive that. We have not gotten um, total administrative expenses and the likes. So we have to drive that up on to the revenue. So we can close this out as well. And um, we move up to the consolidated income statement here. So for revenue, of course, revenue can be found in working two. I will just go and pick my revenue up from working two as 149,000. The cost of sales can also be found in working two. Go and pick my team, I'm gonna carry my team from working two. The other income is now nil. Again, I refer you to working two. Is now nil because the intra-group dividend has been eliminated. We have share income from a loss from Amber. That's the next thing. So the loss from Amber was done in working four. Can just refer you to working four. So for distribution costs, we didn't adjust it. So we just have to go and pick our figures from the question. 
So we say distribution cost of 4,000 plus 2,000. So I can just write it in here, 4,000 plus 2,000. Administrative costs, we, are, we adjusted it, so it's a working two candidate. So we go to working two and pick our something up. So working two, working two. Finance cost was not adjusted, so we have to pick it from the question. So that was one, two plus 900. As one, two plus 900. The income tax was not also adjusted, so we have to pick it from the question. That's 8,700 plus 2,600. Eight seven plus two six hundred. So there we go. That's our final figure, the bottom line. So we can just say um, in the question there is nothing like OCI. So but we still have to create that line. So we see all that comprehensive income. Of course, it's new. Then we have total comprehensive income. Is this plus this? Those profits for the year attributable to owners of the rent. This is usually a balancing figure. And to NCI, CI was working five. So the profit for the year was 22,000. Um, NCI share of profit for the year as calculated in working five or working six, sorry, was 2,400. So that means the Parent tone is just a balancing figure. So that's this minus this. Here we go, come on, drive. So the next thing is total comprehensive income. We can also do something similar to in working six. So we can just come to working six. So what we can do is this. So we'll say this, this down, we'll call this profit, call this total comprehensive income. The subsidiary total comprehensive income is also as good as 13,000 because there was nothing like OCI. Same things that happened here also happened here. So it's pretty much the same. And so that share is also 2.4. So we can revert this place so total comprehensive income is also 22,000 NCI so also 2,400 then the parents is also the balancing figure
people? That is the end of the question. Please ask your own question. I drop my mic. Rose Said, Victor Shei, Ifai Agada, and Ku. Ah, what's your questions? Any question? My people, any question? None for now. Any question? Victor, any question? Okay. No questions. How did we get the 20% NCI? All right. Firstly, I will just take you to the question. According to the question, the stake acquired was 80%. So that means the remaining 20% is NCI. I hope that is clear, Ruth. So the remaining 20% is NCI. So that's how we got that 20%. Yeah, thank you. Any other question? Okay. In the absence of no question, we can take some time again to look at the second question two. Okay, if I please go ahead. Sorry, Mr. Isaac. Yep. Um, How much what, you what if the associate pays dividend? Okay. A dividend paid by the associates should not feature in the profit or loss account. Mm -hmm. If the question said that they have included it anywhere in the profit or loss account, that dividend must be removed. Of course, there are some questions where they want to test your intelligence. They will tell you that a dividend received from an associate is maybe 10 million, and that 10 million has been added to other income. That's not correct. Dividend received from an associate is a cash flow item. It is not part of profit or loss account, so it cannot feature in profit or loss account. What should go into profit or loss account as far as the associate is concerned is share or profit or loss from the associate. That's it. I hope that's clear. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm ready. If you are ready, we can look at question two. Solve it again using the same approach. And we call it a diet. So if you want me to go ahead, you can just send, if I can see three shoots on the group chat, you can say shoot, or you can say, uh -huh, uh -huh. I will read it from the group chat. I don't know how you want to spell that. You can send it to the group chat. Once I see three of those, I go ahead with question two. People, fire on, okay? Two more persons. Please shoot, sir. What are you shooting, Victor? The next one, there's one more person I'll go ahead. Please go ahead, okay? Rose has given us the final order, general rules. So we move to question two. It's another NCCA pass question. Uh, I think it was for 16 marks, cheap marks, if you know what you are doing. 
So I will read it again. Read. On 1st August 2007, Patronic purchased 18 million of a total of 24 million equity shares in Sardonic. The acquisition was through a share exchange of two shares in Patronic for every three shares in Sardonic. Both companies have shares with a power value of one Naira each. Market price of Patronic's shares at 1st August 2007 was five Naira 75 Cobol per share. These are information used for calculating. So guide. Patronic will also pay in cash on 31st July 2001, two years after acquisition. Two Naira 42 Cobol per acquired share of Sardonic. Patronic cost of capital is 10% per annum. The reserves of Sardonic on 1st April 2007 were 69 million Naira. Patronic has held an investment of 30% of the equity shares in Acerbic for many years. The summarized income statements for the three companies for the year ended 31 March 2008 are all figures assume correct. I will not be calling them line by line. The following information is relevant. Additional information one. The fair values of the net assets of Sardonic at the date of acquisition were equal to their current amount with the exception of property and plant. Property and plant had fair values of 4.1 million Naira and 2.4 million respectively in excess of their carrying amounts. The increase in the fair value of the property would create additional depreciation of 200,000 in the consolidated financial statement in the post acquisition period to 31 March 2008. And the plant had a remaining life of five years, straight line depreciation at the date of acquisition of Sardonic. Okay, there's an important line. All depreciation is treated as part of cost of sales. The fair values have not been reflected in Sardonic's financial statement no fair value adjustments were required on the acquisition of Acerbic. Additional information two, the finance cost of Patronic do not include the finance cost on the deferred consideration. This is very linear. Some, some questions will not tell you this. Additional information three, prior to its acquisition, Sardonic had been a good customer of Patronic. In the year to 31 March 2008, Patronic sold goods at a selling price of 1.2.1 Naira 2.5 million per month to Sardonic, both before and after its acquisition. Patronic made a profit of 20% on the cost of these sales. At 31st March 2008, Sardonic still held inventory of 3 million at cost to Sardonic of goods purchased in the post acquisition period from Patronic. Additional information for. An employment test on the goodwill of Sardonic conducted on 31st March 2008 concluded that it should be written down by 2 million. The value of the investment in Acerbic was not impaired. All items in the above income statement are deemed to accrue evenly over the year. Additional information six, ignore deferred tax. And additional information last, it is the group policy to value the non-controlling interest at its proportionate share of the fair value of the subsidiaries 
identifiable net asset. We are required to prepare the consolidated income statement for the petroleum group for the year ended 31st March 2008. Note, assume that the investment in ASEBIC has been accounted for using the equity method since its acquisition. People of God, can we go ahead? Yes, we can go ahead. Remember how we approach the question. Remember the story, the story of every group accounting question or um, is about from acquisition, post acquisition, then we may now have an investment in our source. It. Remember that when you are at acquisition, don't forget, when you are at acquisition, what is your headache? Goodwill is your headache when you are at acquisition. When you are at acquisition, you are expected to check if or how each item used in calculating goodwill will affect the profit or loss account. And there is a way, it's, it's quite mechanical. There is a way each of these items affect profit or loss. It's all documented in that key point. So let's go ahead. If the story is going to start at acquisition, if at acquisition we handle goodwill, the first item for handling goodwill is consideration transfer. So I go into the question again. I search out the consideration transferred to acquire the subsidiary. And that will take me to the first paragraph. In the first paragraph, what I can gather is that there are two forms of consideration transferred. There is the share exchange and there is the deferred consideration. Most times when you see cost of capital, they just drop it in this income statement or group accounting question. Be wary. There is a deferred consideration playing around there. That is why they gave you that cost of capital most times. We have already learned that the share exchange does not impact income statement directly because it's more of an adjustment in the balance sheet because there are equity items that will be involved, share exchange. However, the deferred consideration would affect the income statement. Let's peep into this key point and see what the key point said about deferred consideration. Look at it. It says that any unwinding of discount should be added to finance cost. So that means we have a first impact on profit or loss. And that impact on profit or loss is through the deferred consideration. Let's leave too much grammar. Let's go straight to the Excel document where we do our calculations. So this time we're on Patronic. So we say Patronic, Patronic Group. Consolidated.
So we'll start our group structure. The first um, thing is to say, uh, what is the name of that parent to oh, patronic? So we'll say patronic, patronic in, um, what's the name of the subsidiary in Sardonic? Patronic in Sardonic. And we now say the remaining is left for the NCI. And don't forget, once you do that, you must check the date of acquisition and you must also check the reporting dates so that you'll be careful to know if there was an acquisition during the year. So Patronic in Sardonic, let's look at the question. What is the stake? 18 million out of 24 million. So we can just say 18 divided by 24 times 100. That will give us the percentage. So we'll say 18 divided by 24 times 100. So it's 75%. Lo and behold, there is control. So once it is above 50%, there is control. So it means that the remaining 25% is NCI. Once we have done that, my people, the next thing, the next thing is to check the date of acquisition. We have to be very careful. We have to be very careful because it may be an acquisition during the year. So in the question, the date of acquisition was 1st August, 2007. The date of acquisition was 1st August, 2007. So 1st August, 2007. I will just change that format to date. So it was 1st August, 2007. 2007, 1st August, 2007. Um, I will prefer the formatting we used here. So on 1st August, 2007, oh, working. Okay. okay. And the reporting date is 31 March 2008. My people, 2000 and August 2007 and March 2008. So the year starts in April 2007. Oh, the year, the, this 2008 year started in April 2007. So it's a no-brainer. This is an acquisition during the year. So we have mm -hmm. August, September, October, mm -hmm. November, December. That's eight months, are we? That's eight months. Eight months into the year. So it's clearly an acquisition during the year. We have to be very, very careful. We move to investment two. Patronic in Acerbic. That one they gave us clearly that is 30%. So this is an associate. This is clearly an associate. It falls within our 20% to 49% range. Again, we'll look at it again, date of acquisition, reporting date. So we don't have our fingers burnt. So for this associate, when was the date of acquisition? I will peep into the question again to get that. So the date of acquisition of the associate was, um, Patronic, uh, Cost of cap the results of Sardonic K. Sardonic okay. has held oh, this one has been a long time ago. So this is mm -hmm. before the current year. 
So it's been a long time ago since they acquired that associate. So no issues around acquisition during the year. We are safe. Our typical workings too is analysis of adjusted line items. So remember, the idea is when calculating goodwill, what are the ingredients for calculating goodwill? Number one is consideration transferred. And we have seen that the company had a deferred consideration. So since there is a deferred consideration, there's what is referred to as unwinding of discount. So finance costs will be affected. How then do we calculate this unwinding of discount? We'll calculate that in working three. Unwinding of discount. So we'll say the future value because it means that we have to discount the future value to its present value. So in the question, what is the future value? Take a look at it in the first paragraph. They said that um, now I'm on the um, fourth line. Patronic will also pay in cash on 31st July 2009, two years after. Two Nera, 42 Kobo per acquired share. And the cost of capital is 10%. So what I will simply do is to say two Nera, 42 Kobo multiplied by the 18 million shares that was acquired. When I multiply those two figures, I'll be able to get the future value that Patronic is expected to pay in two years time. So I go straight to my working. So that's 2.42 times 18 million. 43560. Okay, don't worry. I have Excel here. Don't worry. I'm covered. So that's 2.42 times 18 million. Now, the cost of capital or the discount rate they've given us as 10%. Don't forget your formula. So discounting factor. Remember that your formula, they will say one plus R raised to power, raised to power minus two, because the number of years we are talking about is two years. So say one plus 10% raised to power minus two. And that's our discounting factor. So that means the present value is discounting factor times future value. Let me just put here how we derive the future value. That's 2.42 times 18 millions. So how then do we get the finance cost? Simple. So the finance cost will now be because we unwind discount now. So we'll say this present value of 36,000 times the same discount rate of 10%. But remember that this 10% is per annum and it was an acquisition during the year. So we we'll have to say times eight divided by 12. Otherwise, will be sinking without trace if we forget that 8 over 12. The sinking will be gradual until we finish the rubbish we have done. So I will just layer them one by one. So I will call this A. I will call the discount rate B. I will call the discounting factor C. And the present value is a function of the discounting factor. That is D, let me say D is equal to C times 10%, that is B. Mm. 
So that is the finance cost. So we have to add it to the group finance cost. So I can just call that unwinding of discount. And I got it from working three. So we pick um, patronic finance cost. I will just get that from the question. Patronic finance cost is 2000. <clears throat> And anything I'm picking for sardonic, I multiply all by eight divided by 12. So I will go again to pick sardonic's finance cost. So I'll say this times eight divided by 12. I hope we understand why we are dividing by eight by 12, because it was an acquisition during the year. So that is it for the consideration transferred. We have fished out something that affected PLL from the consideration transferred. And that thing is this finance cost because there was a deferred consideration. We are fine with that. The next thing in calculating good you remember is the value of NCI. And if you recall, we said that what affects profit or loss in the value of NCI only comes in at the point of apportioning profit for the year. So the, the preparation proper doesn't come in. So it's when we get to the last working where we have to share or give the NCI his own share of profit. That is when we now talk of how we value, of, value NCI. So that will take us straight to the third component of calculating goodwill, which is the fair value of net asset at acquisition. So I'll just open the question so I can see what they said in that place. I read additional information one who talks about the fair value of the subsidiaries net assets. The fair values of the net assets of Sardonic at the date of acquisition were equal to their current amount with the exception of property and plant. Property and plant had fair values of 4.1 million and 2.4 million respectively in excess of their current amount. The increase in the fair value of the property would create additional depreciation of 200,000 in the consolidated financial statement in the post acquisition period. So no begging, we can see an extra depreciation already clearly stated in the question of 200,000. Let's see if we'll see any other extra depreciation. They now said that the plant had the remaining life of four years. Oh, there is extra depreciation too on the plant. So let's just go ahead and calculate the extra depreciation. So I will just return to my workings. Remember when you are dealing with that third ingredient, which is the fair value of a net asset of the subsidiary, that extra depreciation or reduction in depreciation tends to be the main thing. Not to say the others should not, you shouldn't pay attention to the others. So the extra depreciation on the property was stated in the question and they said it was 200,000. Extra depreciation. Okay, if I ask a question, if I please go for it. Um, sorry, I think I missed a step when we are computing the finance cost. The 2,400 okay. was promoted mm. using what exactly? Eight over yeah, 12. Eight, eight over 12. If you recall from the working one, we noted that the subsidiary was acquired eight months into the year. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have, because that 10% is a per annum rate, but we acquired the subsidiary eight months into the year, eight months, about three months into the year itself. I think I should just remove this. So the date of acquisition was August. So it's mm -hmm. August, September, October, November, mm -hmm. December, January, February, March. That's eight months. 
So if there's anything that's going to be a one-year thing, we must always ensure yeah. we parate it. Mm. So that's the reasoning behind parating that stuff by eight over 12. Okay, yeah, thanks. All right. So for the extra depreciation, we have the property, which the question said it should be depreciated by 200. Then we have the plant. We need to depreciate the plants by four years. And don't forget how we must always pour it. So let us see the figure we have to spread over four years as stated in the question. So it is 2.4 million for the plant. And we are expected to depreciate over four years in a straight line basis. I return to my Excel document. So it is 2.4 divided by four years. But I have to multiply it by eight over 12 because it's an acquisition during the year. So here we go, we have the extra depreciation sorted. So extra depreciation relates to fair value of net assets. If we go by our sequence, you remember we started from consideration transferred, value of NCI, net asset of subsidiary. The last thing is impairment loss. So we search for the impairment loss from the question. Additional information one does not say anything about an impairment loss. Additional information two does not, oh, additional information three does not, but additional information four says something, it says that an impairment test on the goodwill of Sardonic conducted on 31st March 2008 concluded that it should be written down by 2 million. Simple. We take that 2 million and we add it to our administrative expenses or any line item that they have directed, directed us to take it to. I will just be more practical with it and take it to administrative expenses since they are silent. So that will make me create a second item which I want to adjust. So it's payment loss. And that's just um, two millions. So I want to make this half commas. Again, we go and pick Patronic's administrative costs, 12.5. And whatever we are picking for Sardonic, don't forget that we must pull rate it. Come on, dry. So that's it for the impairment loss. So we have looked at everything that goes into calculating goodwill. When we checked the consideration transferred, we found the deferred consideration and that begat working three, where we did an unwinding of discount. When we checked the value of NCI, NCI was valued at proportionate value. 
that doesn't come in yet. It comes in at the point of sharing the profit to NCI. When we checked the fair value of net assets at acquisition, we found out that there was extra depreciation on property and plants. We have dealt with those. When we checked the impairment loss, we found out there was impairment loss of 2 million. We have added it to the administrative cost. Fine. That marks the end of anything that relates to at acquisition. That takes us into post acquisition. Recall, once you are dealing with post acquisition, the focus, the focus or the focus is on intra group transactions. And intra group transactions can come in different forms. So you need to check the question to see any intra group transaction. The key point I've stated the typical intra group transactions you would normally stumble on. But I will just go into the question. I know what intra group transactions are like. So I start reading from the first additional information. The first one talks about a fair value of net asset. It is not in an, an intra group transaction. Working two talks about the deferred consideration. It is not an intra group transaction. But there we go. Working three. Working three talks about sale of inventory during the year. And sale of inventory is a typical intra group transaction. I read. Prior to his acquisition, Sardonic had been a good customer of Patronic. Hmm. In the year to 31st March 2008, Patronic sold goods, that's parent is the seller, at a selling price of 1.2.5 million per month, 1.25 million per month to Sardonic, both before and after its acquisition. Patronic made a profit of 20% on the cost. Ladies and gentlemen, that is markup, not margin. At 31 March 2008, Sardonic still held inventory of 3 million. Remember, there are two things you need to do when there is a sale of inventory. First, eliminate the sales value. Secondly, calculate the unrealized profit and add it to cost of sales. Once you have done those two things, ladies and gentlemen, you don't finish anything relating to sales of inventory. It is down, done. So the first thing we must do is to calculate the sales value between Patronic and Sardonic after the date of acquisition. So you will see that they said that Patronic was selling to Sardonic even before acquisition. Nothing concerns us with what they sold between each other before acquisition. Our focus is post acquisition, after its acquisition. Between the date of acquisition and the year end, we have eight months. That means they've sold goods to Sardonic for eight months. So if there's going to be a sales value, the sales value will be for eight months. So I will just go calculate my sales value first. I move into my Excel document. That will bring me to what I will refer to as working for. No, okay, working for should be on realized profit. That's the second thing we'll do. The first thing we do is um, knock out the intra group sales. So I will just say intra group sales. Intra group sales. That is. Um, 1.2 million times eight months, eight months. And remember that I have to knock it out from revenue and cost of sales. Eight months. So, can put it. As one, two, five, zero times eight months. That's 10,000. Eliminated from revenue and eliminated from cost of sales. 
So the revenue figure for Patronic, we'll just go and pick it up from here. And the revenue figure for Sardonic, I must be careful to ensure that I multiply it by eight over 12. The cost of sales for Patronic, I pick it up. And the cost of sales for Sardonic, I ensure that I multiply it by two. 8 over 12. So I'm doing well. Point to me. I'm doing well. So we look through the question again. Do we have any other form of intra group transaction? That's the next question. We go into the question. Do we have any other form? None. The only intra-group transaction was in working three and it is down, we've taken it out. We have knocked out intra-group sales. Okay, we are supposed to also calculate unrealized profits. Unrealized profits is always on the unsold inventory. We have to calculate the margin and from there, and calculate the unrealized profit. I think we did something similar here. So I'll just come here and I will copy what we have here. So I will start with my unsold inventory. Uh, the question, I go in there to search for my unsold inventory. The unsold inventory, here it is 3 million, and the markup is 20% this time. So I go and use my, those information. So it's 3 million, markup is 20%, not 25%. So that is 20 divided by 100 plus 20. And the unrealized profits. So 20 divided by 100. Mm. Okay, 20 divided by 100. 20 okay so on your last profit will be this times this that's 500 so we can just come here and then it's here to state the unrealized profit based on working for. We added to cost of sales. It's 500. So since we have dealt with the issue at acquisition, we have dealt with post acquisition. The last next thing we'll do is to calculate the income or loss we are going to earn or incur from our dear associate. So that will take us to working five. Investment in Acerbic and Acerbic is our associate. No, sorry, income from associates. Don't forget the first line in getting the income is to say parent share. The parent in this case is Patronic's share of profit for the year. Profit for the year. Profit or loss for the year as the case may be. Let's even see what the, the associate may do. The associate this time 
earn the profit of 6,000. So it's simple, we say 6,000 multiplied by 30%, no operation, because unlike the previous question we solved, this associate was not acquired during the year. So we can just say 6,000 multiplied by 30%, which is our stake in the associate. The next thing is impairment loss on investment in associates. We we'll check again in the question. I will just go straight to the question to see whether there was any impairment loss. And my gaze exactly is on working for. Working for says that the value of the investment in ASEBIC was not impaired. So I'll return to my workings again. Time is impairment loss is new. Unrealized profit, where and so is the seller. Where associate is the seller. And there was no such during the year. So we have a total there, total, total. Adding it up, that will give me 1,800. Don't forget how we move. Once we have gotten the income from the associates, the final thing to do is to share the profit for the year. NCI's share of profit for the year. So the first thing is Sardonic's profit for the year. This time, we have to pour it because there was an acquisition during the year. So let's go and check out Sardonic's profit for the year. I will just move here. Sardonic's profit for the year is 13.5. So I will do 13,500 times eight divided by 12. We have to pour it. So 13,500 times eight divided by 12. Then the next thing are the adjustments. If there was extra depreciation, we take it down. If there was reduction in depreciation, of course, we deduct. If there was impairment loss on full goodwill, we deduct. If there was unrealized profit, where sub is the seller, we also adjust. So in the question, we start with extra depreciation. For the question, extra depreciation came in two foods, double, double, 200 and 400. That was 600. So we have to deduct the extra depreciation. The impairment loss in the question was on partial goodwill. So it's new here. The seller was the parent, if you check through the question. So new. So we have the adjusted profit to be All of this so this is profit for the year. We have total comprehensive income. Still same, same, sorry. Okay. 
So when you see our share, since NCI holds 25%, we'll just multiply all this by 25%. Do the same here. So NCI share at 25%. Lo and behold, that marks the end of the question again. So we just go and fill out. So I'll just call up, close out all my workings. Total. So it's time for me to prepare the consolidated POL. So my revenue is in working two because I adjusted it. My cost of sales is also in working two. My cost of sales is in working too. My distribution cost, my admin cost is also in working too. My finance cost is also in working too. And I should add another line item called income from associates. That is from So the income from associates is from working five. So we move. Since my revenue is in working two, I will just go to working two to pick it up. My cost of sales is also there. I do the same thing. Go to working two to pick it up. My distribution cost was not adjusted, so I will go and pick it up manually. I will simply say this guy plus, remember I have to parate it times eight divided by 12 My administrative cost was adjusted, so I will go to work in two. My finance cost was also adjusted, so I would go to working two again. My income from associates exists in working five. So there's an income this time. before I will now entertain my profit before tax. My income tax expense was not adjusted, so I have to pick it from the question. Patronic plus Sardonyx 8 over 12. Yeah, cool. So I finish it up with my NCI. So I move to NCI. NCI got 2,100 of the profit.
You also got 2,100 of the total comprehensive income. Recall that the parent's share is a balancing figure. The parent's share to is a balancing figure. So I will just create space for to accommodate the total comprehensive income. Here we go, that marks the end of the question. My people, that marks the end of the question. So I put it to you, any question thus far? Any question? Rose, Victor, Agada, Ifain, Matthew and everybody on the call, any question? Any question? Any question? Fine, do you have any question? No question. Um, okay, all right. So in the absence of no question, we can end the class here. This is about three hours now, so far. So we see the logic with the PL. Pick your uh, items used in calculating goodwill and use them to adjust as much as possible. Move to your post acquisition. Look for intra-group transactions and trade them accordingly. When you are done with your post acquisition transactions, move to your income from associates. Calculate that. Once you are done with your income from associates, share the profits, give NCI his own share. That's the bulk of it. Any question before we close this class once again? Okay. Thank you. Can we, can, we, can we get the sheet, sir? Why not? I will share it after this immediately. After all this, I will share it on the group immediately. Thank you. Sir. Yes, boss. All right. So, um, outside of this uh, session, if you have any questions, what we have done so far, including that uh, ratio analysis, we're not able to just finalize yesterday. Please, don't hesitate to send me a chat. I'm just a chat away. I'm a call away. If you are low on credit, flash me. I will call you back. Thank you very much for listening to me. The absence of no question. We can end at this point. Have an, a great evening. I'll be an, a great evening. Yeah, have a great evening. And don't fight. Thank you. <laughs>